Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm sure you've had a great evening last night after the opening ceremony, and I welcome you all on behalf of ISPI to our very first keynote lecture. Um, with great pleasure, I introduce Dr. Steiner Brin. Dr. Brin has been a peace builder and dialogue worker since 1976 with the Nansen Academy and the Nansen, Nansen Center for Peace. Um, and he has continued to work in different countries, building a dialogue between people, bringing them, bringing them together. And for his contributions, he has been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize seven times. And although he has officially retired from the Nansen uh, Center for Peace, um, he continues to work and is an inspiration to people around the world. And yeah, we are very happy to have you here today. Um, I would conclude by saying a thank you to ISFIT, uh, who helped us get in contact with Dr. Brin and appreciate their support. And without further ado, I Welcome, Dr. Brin, for his talk. Thank you. Good morning. It's, uh, it's very nice to, to be here. It's very nice to see you. And um, as you just heard, I'm a great supporter of ISFIT, which is a similar festival in uh, Norway. And I'm very glad uh, to learn that this is going on here in uh, Ilmenau. What I will try to do, I will not only try, I will do it. I will talk about tradition, transition, but in general, that's something we all know. We all have habits, ways of being, we all have ways of doing things that we learn from our parents, etc. And we all somehow feel that there are parts of us, maybe it would be better to change. I promise to change uh, once a week. I still have trouble with some of my uh, Norwegian habits. <clears throat> but this, this is an issue around the world. So <clears throat> I will try to go behind it a little bit and question whether there is a conflict between tradition and renewal. I will also ask, are there moral dilemmas? Do we understand each other's <clears throat> moral compass? So when we discuss and talk, how well do we understand each other? And what is this all about? It's all about how to best live together. We've been thinking about that for thousands of years. How do we best live together? And what needs to be changed in order to improve our lives. I saw on the list <clears throat> there were people here from Kosovo, Kosovo and from Serbia. Right now there is a border dispute. So the border dispute is about making Serbia more Serbian by giving the most Albanian populated part of Serbia to Kosovo. Then in return Kosovo gives the most Serb-populated area to Serbia. So both places become more mono-ethnic. And the argument is, well, then it functions better. Because, you know, we understand each other. And, of course, the counter-argument is, when are we going to stop changing the borders? And when are we going to start to learn how to live together. 
And I see there are many people not from Europe. So it's important to stress that even Europe has undergone dramatic changes the last four or five years. The multi-ethnicity of most European countries is increasing dramatically. In my hometown, Oslo, you don't find Vikings. You find people from Pakistan, from Somalia, from Syria, from Vietnam, from all over the world. The problem in Oslo is that some schools have only immigrants and refugees. Other schools have only Norwegians. And then we say, you have to integrate into the Norwegian society. You have to learn who we are. You have to learn our rules and our way of thinking. How can they do that if they don't meet a Norwegian? Because there is no Norwegian in the school. <clears throat> when parents come to parents' meetings, they don't meet Norwegian parents. They go home to a high-rise building where no Norwegian lives. They go to a shopping mall where no Norwegian shops. And vice versa. And vice versa. If I have a life project, it's called How to Understand the Other. I grew up in a country I learned as a child differences are on the outside, our heart is the same. So I really believed the human heart is the same, but we have different colors, different clothes, different ceremonies, but deep inside we are similar. Maybe one of the most important things I've learned in life is that that is not true. Our hearts are not the same. We human beings are different. I used to think that the more I could feel love, the more I would understand other people who loved. The more I would feel hate, the more I would understand other people that hated. But the truth is, <clears throat> on myself, I don't know anybody else. I can only learn to know them through starting to interact, meet them, talk with them, listen to them, discover them. And that's, of course, why this uh, student festival is so beautiful. Because <clears throat> to create meeting points where people can meet like this is simply uh, fantastic. When I was young, I had, a very, I had a very important experience. It's, a, it's a, an everyday, casual experience, but it deeply influenced my life. I am driving home. There is a hitchhiker. He's standing on a bad spot. I'm only 500 meters from home, so I think there is no point picking him up. But the spot was so bad, so I turned around and I told him, uh, you're standing in such a bad spot. And um, he said, where are you going? Oh, I'm just going home. I said, oh, I'm so tired, you know, I'm, I'm hungry. I mean, could I just maybe go home with you? And I said, of course, why not? He stayed with me for a week, <laughs> couldn't get rid of him. And every night we were fighting. He was an American. And I kept saying, you Americans, you Americans, you Americans. And then one night, he just looked at me and he said, how come you know all these things about us Americans? I was 20, and that question made me feel so stupid. Because what was my answer? 
Well, I've been watching TV. <laughs> I read some newspapers <clears throat> and he looks at me and he says, you've never ever been there? And I said, no. And you have all these opinions about us Americans, hundreds of millions of people. And I realized that concept, Americans, Norwegians, Serbs, is just, in a way, meaningless until you get to know people that are American, that are, you know, Norwegian, that are from Somalia, that are from Armenia. And that has been my work. I'm based in Lillehammer, Norway, <clears throat> only famous for hosting the Winter Olympics in 1994. And we have one dream, and that is to host the Winter Olympics again. Because we can do it human scale. We can do it without a lot of cost. And the Olympics has some of that spirit of bringing people together. People fail to get along because they fear each other. They fear each other because they don't know each other. They don't know each other because they have not communicated with each other. The most important political task in Europe today is to bring children together in school. If children grow up segregated and only get the one history, not the other histories, it's so easy to cultivate the enemy image of the other. And uh, Places I work would be like uh, Mostar, Bosnia Herzegovina. The city is divided by a river. There are many cities like that, divided by a highway, divided by a river, divided by some kind of invisible border. On the left side, you know, lives the Croats. On the right side lives the Bosniaks, the Muslims. And it's not dangerous to cross the bridge. But <clears throat> as a father, you would say, you can stay out until 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, but stay on this side of the bridge. I don't think anything will happen to you if you cross the bridge, but I would feel safer. I would feel safer if you just stay on this side. We get many orders like this from home when we grow up. You can go down to the river, but don't step into the river. You can go to the forest, but don't go into the forest, because then we don't know what will happen. But of course, you also know those kids who went into the river, who went into the forest, who tried to climb the mountain. So there are always people trying to cross the bridge, but to cross the bridge, can sometimes be even worse. To be a crossover is to be a traitor. And when we grow up with enemy images of the other, it's very dangerous if we want to cross over and take a look at the others. What if the others are not as bad as we thought? In order to keep enemy images alive, we, don't, we cannot learn too much about our enemy because we might start to give them a human face. In Norway, it was a myth from the old days before Facebook. In my village, we are all normal. We are educated. We're not as primitive as those on the other side. But the rumor was, on the other side, they only have one eye in the middle of the forehead. This is part of Norwegian mythology. The one-eyed troll. And I have a colleague. He's uh, 72. 
And he tells me that for 13 years, he believed the people on the other island had only one eye. That's why I said before Facebook, because he never saw pictures of them. And uh, when he met one from that other island, it was when he went to junior high school, he had to go to the mainland for the first time. And uh, it was a shock. But sometimes just meeting is enough. If you do believe they are one-eyed. So this is a very important learning experience because my job, <clears throat> my job has been very special the last 25 years. Because we hosted the Olympics in Lillehammer, we got close to Sarajevo that hosted the Olympics in 1984. And we have, over the years, invited people from extreme conflict areas to come and sit and talk. Why did it get so violent? Is there any way we can rebuild trust? The first conversations lasted for three months. So people would come for September, October, November, then a Christmas break, and a new group would come for February, you know, March, April. Three months is a long conversation. I sometimes have friends, they come and tell me, we can't stay married anymore, it doesn't work. And I say, well, did you try a long conversation? What do you mean, long conversation? Mm, three months? Are you crazy? Can't even talk to him for three hours. And in Norway, it's actually a common thing if you get into an argument to leave and smash the door, slam the door. Because you feel you know what the other one is going to say. That's the most stupid uh, uh, way of thinking, and it's very non-dialogical. If you think you know what your enemy thinks, you're most often wrong. You have to sit down and listen. How could we get enemies to come together? Well, I think, like here, we provided them visas. And they had uh, cousins that were refugees that they could visit. <laughs> and uh, uh, we lived at this school where they were living together. You know, so it was like a dormitory, it was dining hall. People got to meet each other in a lot of different contexts. But what was obvious, whether you came from Croatia or Serbia or Macedonia or Kosovo or Bosnia or Montenegro, everybody believed their own truth was more true than the other truth. Everybody believed that we are born in the city of light, but they are victims of nationalistic propaganda. Secondly, they all believed they were the greatest victim and the other ones were the perpetrators, the violent, the aggressors. So whether you're a Serb, Albanian, Muslim, you have a victim mythology that's very strong. But even more important, there are a lot of victims. If you never hear the other story, how do you know what they think? I don't want to be offensive, but uh, I saw on the list there are people from Armenia here. And there is a book called This Was and This Was Not. It's an Armenian woman talking about her upbringing, where she pretty much learned how to hate Turks. And she's maybe 25 when she goes to Istanbul for the first time in her life. And she is surprised that Istanbul is a city with people, with rivers. There was even quite a few Armenians living in Istanbul. For her to be a good Armenian, 
was to fight for the recognition of the genocide in 1915, a genocide that the Turks are denying. And then she really wanted to know why they were denying it. But when she comes there, she discovers they learned something completely different in school. They learned that the Armenians were the bad guys. In the 80s, Armenians blew up uh, an embassy in Lisbon. Lisbon. There was an explosion on the uh, airport in Paris, etc., etc. Recent stories that they hear. It's a good example of how you learn about what they did to us, but not what we did to them. And that's often the basis for, for conflicts. But when we realize that this is kind of coincidental, we're all born with the ability to learn a language, but which language depends on what is spoken around the kitchen table? And this is a fact. You know, this is not an assertion. Welcome to the new group arriving. If you're born into a Palestinian village, or whether you're born into an Israeli village, it's going to influence the rest of your life. <clears throat> we are all able to draw moral conclusions, but our values depend partly on the myths we like <clears throat> and the heroes we worship. So the stories, the fairy tales we hear from grandparents influence us in terms of what we think is right and wrong and what we think a good person is. What does it mean to be a good person? <coughs> I would say it means to act according to your moral compass and move in that direction that you think is good. But moral is not shaped by reason. Moral is very much shaped by emotions. Then our mind is like a defense attorney. So our mind is very good trying to defend us when we do things, justify our actions. But all moral research, not all, but a lot of moral research somehow anchor the moral feeling in our guts. We just know it's wrong. Is it right for a brother and sister to have sex? No. Why not? Why not? <coughs> yes? All right. Okay, that's, 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 a good, that's a good argument. So, if the brother and sister is over 50 and cannot have children, is it then okay? Well, not okay, but not for different reasons. Well, then we would say it's better to have sex with others. So, what if they live on a farm up in the mountains with no others around and there will be no others coming the next 20 years? You know. You can go on like that. The point is, the bottom line, it's just wrong. We know it in the belly. We don't know exactly why, but it's definitely wrong. I know, we could say, um, I, for example, I think it's wrong, but there are some people doing it. Mm. So it's not wrong, but we don't like doing it. Yes. <laughs> I was, I was going to say, you haven't seen my sister, no. <laughs> I, would, um, I, would, I, would, I would not like to do it. <clears throat> my, my point is that our start in life is kind of coincidental. So even to the point of tradition renewal, whether you cherish tradition has a lot to do with the fact whether you were born into a family that cherish tradition. Whether you cherish renewal 
depends on the fact whether you live in a family that actually think transition, renewal is good. When a 20-year-old student come and say, I'm ready to get my own apartment, some parents will say, why? It's going to cost us more. What's wrong with our apartment? Can't you stay here? I know many people who stay at home until they get married. Then other parents say, yeah, it's about time you get on your own. You have to define your own life now. Can't live with your mom and dad forever. But that varies. And we all develop categories and concepts with which we understand the world. But we don't decide which categories and which concepts we learn. Of course, now, when you're students, you can reflect on this. And that's the beauty of education. We human beings are not perfect, but through education, we can lift ourselves a little bit up. We can learn about the seven deadly sins and say, I will not try to commit them. But there are things with us human beings that are not beautiful. So the context of my work has been to sit together with people from divided communities. People that have been raised, often with different languages, with different narratives, very often with the understanding that both believe there is one truth, we know it, but you deny. What they learn in the dialogue meeting is that maybe there are competing truths. Maybe there are ways of seeing. Maybe my story is not more truthful than your story. It doesn't mean that truths are equal, not at all. It just means that the first step I noticed when people talked for three months, let's say the first month, they were so sure they were right and the others were wrong. But then some doubt sneaked in. Maybe my grandfather didn't tell me the whole story. Maybe my politicians didn't tell me the whole story. Maybe my teacher didn't tell me the whole story. Maybe the others have pieces of the puzzle it can be useful for me to listen to if I really want to understand the whole picture. I bet most of you have seen these two pictures uh, before. The one is of an old lady. And then when you look at it, you see there is a young lady too. And when you see the old lady and the young lady, you can see both at the same time. And the other picture is also pretty easy. It's uh, two faces or a vase you can put flowers in or can be a prize in a competition. But look at this one. First you see kind of a dice square, if you look at it for about 20, 30 seconds, it changes and you can see an other structure. It depends on which side is closest to you. Are some of you able to see it both ways? But can you see both ways at the same time? So with the old lady and the young lady, you could see both at the same time. But here, you have to actually shift perspective. And that's the essence of dialogue. When you go into dialogue, you try to see it from the other point of view. And you have to leave your own point of view behind. If you're in favor of transition, 
and you are arguing with somebody reactionary who don't want to change at all, you will not get anywhere by just saying you're stupid, you don't understand, you're not smart enough, uh, you just want everything to stay the way it is and it's bad. If you really want to create movement in the conversation, you have to somehow try to look at it from that other side. Not because the other side is right, but you need to understand better how that other person sees the world. That willingness to go into the other position is not there when you are in a conflict. You're fighting. I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to spend three months. I don't want to spend a weekend with them after what they did to us. I don't even want to talk to them because to talk to them means to honor them, to respect them in ways they don't deserve after what they did to us. In this uh, Nansen Academy in Lillehammer, people live together. And when they arrive, they arrived, of course, with their ethnic identity on the forefront. I'm a Serb, you're Albanian, you're Macedonian, you're a Bosniak, you're a Muslim, you're a Montenegrin, or you're Israeli, you're a Jew, you're an Arab, you're a Palestinian, you're a Ukrainian, you're a Russian. But as we start to do things together, and in the beginning, doing things together is more important than talking. So the party you had last night was very good. It's a good way to start. <laughs> uh, because I will never like you. I will never like you based on your ethnic identity. But you're a good basketball player. We go to a jazz concert. Wow, you like jazz too? People sit down, ah, I'm a teacher, you're a teacher. I'm a lawyer, you're a lawyer. I'm a parent, you're a parent. So people start to connect in other arenas and start to build a little respect. I hate you as a Serb, but you're a good basketball player. And then they take that respect back into the dialogue room and are more willing to listen to each other. So this model, I call it a dialogue square. It just means that if you are in the position of creating a dialogue between people, you have to think about the social, you have to think about the educational, you have to think about the cultural and the physical components. And the physical components can be everything from hiking a mountain to dancing or taking a sauna. I remember one Muslim woman from Baneluka and one Serb woman from Baneluka. They didn't speak to each other for three weeks. But both liked to take the sauna. And I walked down and I turned up five degrees. And the ice melted in the sauna. You don't melt ice with a good lecture. You melt ice by doing things together where you learn more about the other and it can build some respect. What would these seminars look like? We would start to talk about what shaped who you are. What are the formative experiences in your younger life? This is crazy, but in my country, what creates big conflicts are animals like wolves. We are wolf haters and wolf lovers. So some people want to kill every wolf in Norway. And some people say the wolves, according to international declarations, have a right to live. And I was opening a wolf exhibition. And they said, to make this interesting, we will invite a wolf killer and a wolf lover. And I said, what's the point? They will have a debate. It will be table tennis. We all know what they both think. And it might be fun. 
It might be entertainment, but it's not going to change anything. Will you do it on my condition, I said. And they said, well, what, what's that? I want both of them to tell their story. What happened in your younger life that made you a wolf lover? What did your grandpa tell you? What did you experience? What movie or book or story? And the wolf hater, he really told the story about how a wolf killed his dog when he was a little boy. In other words, his hate was not because the wolf are killing sheep. But this dog was his brother. So when we listen to the stories about what shaped how we think, it's easier to understand why we think differently. When I tell my story, when you go into group work, when you tell your stories, it's easier to understand why you support tradition or why you support transition. The second question we deal with is how the conflict has affected your life. And then people tell stories that are brutal, but very often on both sides. When there is a conflict, both sides very often suffer. And that is also true on, in a family. When kids fight with the parents, often both sides suffer. When you hear that they have also lost somebody, their village was burned down. It's easier to feel sympathy, even empathy. We're all paying a price for this conflict. Then we go into a more academic discussion. What are the causes of the conflict? And, and when we talk about the causes of the conflict, we do it in a more academic way. But we have established trust in the room so that people are willing to listen to different causes. Because when you have a conflict, like in Kashmir, there will be different explanations to why that conflict is so powerful. This is a very interesting question. How is the inter-ethnic communication and cooperation in your home community? I don't believe in teaching. This is, this is extraordinary. Now I'm sharing all my experiences, so you know, I'm a little bit look like a teacher to you. But in the room, in a dialogue room, you cannot be a judge, not even a teacher. You must somehow make the space for people to trust each other, so they start to talk. And the thing is, when people live apart, it becomes normal. In Stolots, Stolots is a small village in uh, Bosnia Herzegovina, close to Mostar. It is a primary school, very few students, but there is a Bosnian part and a Croat part of the school. I visited some Saturday morning. The cleaning lady was opening the door. So I look at the Croat part and I ask her, could I see the Bosnian part? And she looks at me and she says, yes, I think, but I've never been there. Because the Bosnian part uh, or the other part has another cleaning lady. When schools are divided, it's not because of space. There is a morning shift and an evening shift, so the students don't interact. Why is that important? To keep the political base of people voting for their own. And um, when they start talking about it, it doesn't seem as normal. You know, if 60-year-olds who live in the same community have segregated soccer teams, it doesn't make sense. Because on FC Barcelona or Manchester United, you don't ask for passport. You know, you ask, can you play soccer? And, uh, you know, top the team. 
And then we talk about the advantages and disadvantages of segregation. And often people haven't engaged in that conversation. And when you engage in the conversation, it doesn't seem as attractive. I'm not saying this as a truth, I'm saying this as based on experience. The most important tool of communication is questions and answers. It's a fantastic way to communicate. But we often ask too fast, and we answer too fast. You know, a good lecturer, he talks for 45 minutes. Any questions? And if there are two minute silence, he says, okay, thank you, see you next week. If he was real good, he would say, take a few days, think about the questions you have, send them to me on email, and I'll start next time <coughs> responding to your questions. I use this, so let's say in a group of 16, we have eight from one side, eight from the other side. Formulate the 10 most important questions you want to ask the other side. I do that one day and they see the questions, they go to sleep and they meet the next day to answer. It's very powerful. It's very powerful. Just try it at home with your family. Everybody is allowed to ask each other 10 questions and the rule of the game, you must answer truthful. It can split the family actually. <clears throat> when I noticed these differences in people, I told you, and this is very important. They would come as Serbs, as Albanians, as Bosniaks. Over the 25 years, there has been 3,000 people from ex-Yugoslavia in my home. They would come with their ethnic identity. But then I would notice there are splits within the Serbian group. There are splits within the Albanian group. There are splits within the Bosnian group. And those division lines often would go along transition tradition. If the participants were young, they would often have an email, a mobile phone. They had traveled before. I've also had a lot of older participants working with interpreters from villages. They never had an email address. If you travel in Western Balkan, you can actually see almost coexisting the traditional and the renewal. A city like Pristina is becoming very modern. But you don't need to travel far to get out in a village. It is almost 100 years back in time. You can even see it driving on the roads. I say one way to measure modernity is to look at the vehicles on the road. I was picked up on the airport in Berlin and driven here yesterday. I saw only cars. It's kind of boring. But if you're on a road in, in, in you know, South Serbia, you might even see vehicles and you don't see where the engine is, but it's moving. You see animals pulling, you know, cartridges. You see uh, even people pulling. So the more variation of means of transportation along the road, probably the more traditional the space. It's not wars that divides us. It is a very human way of organizing the world. We divide people in us and them. And this is based on research, you know, all over the world. So whether you live in uh, a labor neighborhood in uh, Philadelphia, whether you're a farmer in uh, India, or you're a fisherman in Norway, 
There is an us and a them. That's not something we can do much about. The problem is when us are mobilized against them. Because this is one of those human weaknesses we cannot do anything about. We human beings are self-righteous. We believe we are right. So when I fight with my wife, my wife is uh, lovable. I love her, you know. Uh, I've been with her for quite some time and I want to stay with her the rest of my life. But when I fight with her, I'm right. If you've seen my wife, you would never pick a fight with her. If you think you're wrong, that would be very stupid. So of course I think I'm right. When this is put into a democracy, it's kind of a dangerous combination. Because the majority has the power, and they also feel they are right. They also feel they are right. And the minority doesn't have power, and they are defined as being wrong. So, how can we look at this, our moral universe? We need to understand whatever we think about tradition or transition. What are the moral values that dominate us. So when we start to fight about what's right and what's wrong, it's so important to understand why other people disagree and what is the moral basis for their disagreement with us. I think we all we all want to be good. But our definition of what is good is so different. What I think is good is defined by my moral universe. And other people might contradict my actions, but also want to do good. They just act within a different moral universe. Can this explain why good people are divided by religion and politics? Can this explain why good people fight? Because they don't spend enough time understanding that we think differently about important issues. Not only do we think differently, but we have completely different moral understanding of the situation. When we look at tradition and transition, anthropologists are looking at the old societies and then looking at the modern societies. And it was very dominant in anthropological research that you somehow looked at this as a development so people are moving from more traditional societies, becoming more modernized, becoming even more postmodern. And this used to be connected to the development of technology. So of course, when you didn't have a train to travel into the city, not that many people traveled into the city. When you didn't have a radio, you didn't listen to news from other parts of the country. When you didn't have newspapers, you didn't read about other people. And when these things came, you know, radio, newspapers, trains, it started to be possible to somehow meet a lot of other people. And then, of course, technology continued. We got airplanes. We got... I mean, I remember when I didn't have a mobile phone. I remember when I didn't have internet. Probably my kids, they will say, Oh, Dad, remember we, when we were kids, we had internet and mobile phones? Oh, really old-fashioned. <laughs> because we all think that what we have now cannot be changed or renewed. You know, this is it, at the end of evolution. My mother, she always said, even back in 1960, I never think 
the world will change as fast as it changed from when I was a kid to now. But it's been changing faster and faster and faster and faster. If we look at this tension between tradition and transition, tradition often cherish, and particularly in the old days, life <coughs> was destiny. If you're born poor, you will stay poor. We have a princess in Norway. She's actually now together with a shaman. And uh, he's black. And uh, if you Google the princess and the shaman, you might find some of the stories about, about this. But some people in Norway say, you should give up your princess title because you're now touring, uh, you're part of this new religious movement, you think you can heal people, and you're earning money on it. And then she says, I cannot give up my princess title. I'm born into this family. It's my destiny. I'm stuck with it. I didn't ask to become a princess. Sometimes she almost talks like it's her punishment, <laughs> but, but she benefited, believe me. <laughs> she had some advantages. Um, but as we grow older, as we get educated, of course we feel there are more choices. In the traditional societies, stability was very descriptive. Life was stable. Not only was it stable, but stability was good. Today, almost the whole European Union is based on mobility. Mobility of knowledge, mobility of the labor force. 20, 20 years ago, I was certain all of us in Europe would have the same passport. Today, 20 years later, I understand it's much more difficult than that. Now, actually, we always have to bring our passport when we travel, because the control has become uh, stricter. So it's not a clear, linear development here. But, of course, transition, the word itself, <clears throat> means mobility. In the traditional societies, there was continuity. It was predictable. Next summer would be like last summer. Next year would be like last year. Tomorrow would be like yesterday. And that's good. Today, we appreciate change so much more. I remember when I grew up, to have a job for your whole life, was a sign of success. So if you were a shoemaker, you were a shoemaker for, you know, 45 years, and that's it. Today, if you keep one job more than 10 years, you're boring. You should change. What was the one key word in Obama's uh, election campaign? Change. Change is so much more appreciated today. In the old societies, security was important to secure the life of the villagers. Many places you can find the, well, you know, not the castle, but the fort, the fort around the city to protect the city. You know, sometimes cities were even built upon a little higher city upon the hill, so you could see the enemy coming. Well, today. Security is not the same word we want, freedom. In the traditional view, we accept authority much more. So if grandpa talks, you do what he says out of respect. Today, in a modern family, grandpa is almost obsolete. At least nobody listens to him. Um, my kids, and I also have grandchildren, 
they make so much fun of me. And I, they think I don't get it, you know, they're just sitting around the table, oh, grandpa is stupid again, and grandpa is hopeless. And I'm, I'm doing it purposely, a little bit jokingly, you know, to, because I like these reactions, so I can say things. And, but uh, there is a famous song by um, Emily Harris, Grandpa, tell me about the good old days, when you knew what was right and you knew what was wrong. Because when grandpa said, that is right and that is wrong, that was right and that was wrong. Today, people actually do wrong things and they're not even sure if they've done something wrong. It was easier when people said, go down to the river, but not into the river. Because then you knew, if I want to respect authority, I return. And if you want to break the rule, you go into the river. But most people would feel a little bad in their stomach when they broke the rules because they knew they were breaking the rules. You have politicians today in Ukraine who are corrupted. They don't know if they're doing something wrong unless they get caught because that's very stupid. So to be stupid is wrong. And if I drive 100 kilometer an hour and the speed limit is 80 and there is no police, Am I doing something wrong? Well, if the police catches me, I'm stupid. And it's wrong. Back in the old days, it was a much more communal, collective feeling. Grandma didn't get up in the morning thinking, what am I going to do today with my life? It was decided for her. Her duty was, to take care of everybody else around her, with food, with clothes, emotions, heal them if they got sick. And today, of course, we get up and we think, do I want to go to the student festival or not? How many of you asked your grandfather if it was a wise thing to do? Not that many. Traditionally, we cherished roots. We people have roots. We are solidly anchored in the ground. And I think it's in the, it's in the Hopi or Navajo, Native American tradition. You want to be buried close to where you were born, to have that connection illustrated. But in the modern world, we have boots, so we can move, travel. In Western literature, often to find yourself, you must leave home. You must go out there in the world. While in Native American uh, poetry, finding yourself is very much finding the roots, the ancestors. It's a big difference if I go up to the Norwegian valleys, to the old Norwegian farms, or whether I go to New York City. Already 100 years ago, when people traveled to New York City, they sent letters home. I'm walking, I'm walking, I'm walking, I'm walking, I'm seeing so much strange stuff, and I can do whatever I want, and nobody will tell my mother. That's a different reality. So, in the modern world, adventure is appreciated. Safety. The Labour Party in Norway was very successful after World War II because they said the most important political goal is safety. Safety for the people. Today we don't want safety anymore. We want more adventure. Safety is slightly boring. In traditional societies, Things were more black and white, right and wrong, absolutism. And uh, in the modern world, we talk about relativism. You come down to the river and you think, should I go into the river or not? Uh, I know grandpa said I shouldn't, but you know, maybe I should. I don't know. Anybody here I can talk to and ask? This is 
a way of being a teacher and trying to communicate, to somehow polarize values. And I'm doing it only because it illustrates an argument, it illustrates a point. But in reality, we talk much more about creative oppositions. So in reality, you don't have ideal models, but you have tension. You have tension between uh, safety and adventure. All people know they need some safety, even when they are adventurous. Only the most crazy people try to climb the uh, K2 in Himalaya. What do I mean by dialogue? I mean a way of communicating where we try to understand why other people think differently. It's a way of communicating, emphasizing active listening. It's a way of communicating when you understand other people, their action make more sense. And you say, now that I understand you better, your actions make more sense. And there is movement. In a dialogue, you have to practice tolerance because other people tell stories you don't like. They do things you don't like. They even tell stories you almost don't believe. But if you want to understand other people, you have to understand which stories they believe in, even if the stories are not true. The moment you say, I don't believe you, you stop the dialogue and you start a debate. And we need debates, of course we need debates. We need debates about what is truth. But if there has not been established any trust, the debate about truth is table tennis. In a dialogue, you need self-discipline. And uh, that means sometimes to bite your tongue. I say dialogue is more violent than debate, you know, because we're bleeding from our tongue. In a dialogue, change is positive, because when you understand better, you change your position. In a debate, of course, you defend your position. You stand up for your position. In a dialogue, you are cooperative, and you practice openness. I will leave these uh, models for you in some way on, uh, on the ISV uh, webpage. So, um, Time is flying, and I'm, I'm, I'll be rushing a little bit to, to finish. So again, a polarized model, where the debate is much more about convincing other people that you are right. Then you have to argue. And sometimes you are right. And of course, you're allowed to try to convince people and argue. But that is not a dialogue. That's my point. I believe I'm right about some things. I argue about those things, but I don't call it dialogue, I call it debate. Debate is much about positioning, I'm for wolves, I'm against wolves. And in a debate, you have moral judgments. How can you want to kill wolves? Are you crazy? It's the best way to, to make people feel insecure. How can you support sex with same sex? How can you support eating your dog? Are you sick? Are you crazy? In Norway, we don't eat our dogs, but if you drive and hit a moose and nobody sees you, you might eat it. It's very good meat, moose meat. And then some people say, well, but somebody owns the dog, you know. It's, it's, a, it's a closer to people. The moose is a wild animal. A lot of people own reindeers. And also reindeers are easier to eat. And that's how we do it in Norway. One thing I've learned, it's not enough to be right. I'm not fanatic. I'm not 100% when I'm right when I'm arguing. But I'm 80% right. And we make this mistake in our head, when we think we are 80% right, it's only 20 left for our opponent. Because we think right is 100. 
What if I'm 80% right and you're 80% right? What if right actually is 160? Why do we think that if we are right, the others must be wrong? If these are creative opposites, transition, transition, we need to somehow integrate them. So what are these moral compasses I'm talking about? What, what, what are these things we learn as children to teach us about right and wrong? And Jonathan Haidt has been doing research for decades about exactly this. He's asking a lot of people what is right, what is wrong, all over the world. Thousands of people have been involved. And from this enormous quantitative material, he's concluding that there are six moral compasses that are very visible. And the first one is what he calls the Care Harm Foundation. Care about other people, do no harm. So care means helping, trying to, to understand. Be good, be good to people, be a good neighbor. Help sick people, help poor people. Don't do harm to others. I sometimes divide the world into door openers and door closers. And you've all met them. You know, you go to an office and, or you apply for a visa. <laughs> you can meet a door opener who looks for possibilities. Or you can f meet a door closer that somehow likes to say no. The next foundation is liberty oppression. When you fight for liberty, you fight the oppressor. And already here, you can see a tension between these two moral foundations. Because if you should do no harm to other people, well, if you fight oppressors, you will harm them. So already here, if parents say, care for others, do no harm, and the children say, we want to fight oppression, we have a fight between parents and children on moral grounds. But we don't take time to explore that moral ground. That's my point. When you go in all the groups throughout the week, take time to explore the moral ground. The third foundation is fairness cheating. So it's very right to be fair. We have different ways of thinking about fairness. Some people think fairness is very important. So when you have a piece of cake, you divide it equally around the table. Some people say fairness is proportional. So you give a little bit more cake to those who like cake, a little bit less cake to those who don't like cake, but it has to be fair. If you're a cheater and hide the cake and don't serve it, no good. Loyalty betrayal. The good thing is to be loyal to your group, to your people, to your country. The worst is to be a traitor. I talked about crossing over the bridge. The fifth moral foundation, authority subversion. So it's wrong to not want to respect authority. And when we talk about tradition renewal, if your moral foundation is to respect authority and authority promotes tradition, it's morally wrong to go against tradition. While transition is actually not something, you know, you might want it and you might, but, but, but it morally is not the right thing to do. And the last, sanctity means actually holy. You look at the world into what is holy, what should be respected, and what is not to be respected. So to curse God, to, to curse religious symbols, 
to, to be against that which is holy is so bad. And this is kind of the most important thing in terms of good and bad. And these are the six moral compasses that Jonathan Haidt argues. Some people have maybe only one of them. Some people have two of them. Some people have all of them. But it's particularly complicated if somebody only have, let's say, liberty and oppression, and somebody else only have authority and subversion. But their disagreement is also on moral ground. So let me summarize. Dialogue is about movement. It's about opening up, looking, exploring. It's about making yourself visible to other people. And it's about building relationships. And when I work with people from Balkan, we talk a lot about how states need transition, while nationality, ethnicity, less so. So in terms of the state, we need to renew our states. We need to somehow have more open in Norway. But it's not a national parade. It's a constitutional parade. And when we have one third of every citizen in Oslo not being Norwegian, we have to see a lot of different kinds of people in the streets. The state is very much about territory. Ethnicity is about soul and spirit. Territories change, soul and spirit, not so fast. The job of the state is to secure infrastructure, while the ethnicity is more about traditions, ceremonies, how we get married, how we bury our dead, how we celebrate. The state is very much about politics, and the states need renewal. While ethnicity is very much about culture, dancing, literature, language. Sometimes we even need to protect, protect some of these traditions so they will not die. Not many people speak the Welsh language. It almost died. And the change when it comes to the states in Europe is very much toward accepting European standards. And those European standards we all agree upon. While we can look at states becoming more similar after transition, but we have a great variety in nationalities, in ethnicities, in lifestyles within our society. Because the state still is there in a way to provide security, while uh, ethnicity is more to provide identity. But of course, with the choice some people feel, you can grow up in Norway and choose to be a Norwegian. You can also choose to be a Nordic. Some choose to be European. Some call themselves cosmopolitan, global citizens. And in one way, I think that's the beauty of it. Although I can travel from Norway, you can never take uh, Norway out of me. I will end by my conclusion. They say I'm greener elsewhere, said the grass. Well, sometimes I am. Thank you. So that was an incredible lecture. Thanks a lot, Dr. Bryn. Um, you've illustrated and demonstrated how your dialogue methodology works and also um, shared many experiences. So we will now have a short discussion with the audience. And I would just like to have or take the first uh, question. Um, so you explain how bringing people together on one platform is important and also understanding their backgrounds uh, is important. Um, however, how do, you, how do you overcome this idea that um, we might be losing something from this reconciliation or dialogue? And would you share some examples where you have 
um, face this and then change that perspective? Well, I think the first thing people feel they are losing when they enter dialogue is uh, that safety. That safety of belonging to one group. And very often I have been part of hiding the meeting. So I had to promise to not let media know uh, from Kosovo, we would have Serbs going north into Serbia in one bus. We would have Albanians going south in another bus. And when they came down to Skopje, Macedonia, they would go into the same bus and drive to Okrid, where we would have the seminar. But I had to promise to not uh, have you know, been seen together. Um, the way to overcome uh, I'm jumping to one of our most successful projects that have been in Macedonia. We examined 630 textbooks in Macedonian, Turkish, and Albanian. And we noticed everyone is cherishing their own, while not mentioning, not understanding the others. So we proposed, if Macedonia want to be a multicultural society, we need a new curriculum for everybody. And that new curriculum must teach everybody something. So my answer to you is actually boring and no magic fix. Um, it's very tough to enter dialogue in a conflict because present current attitudes. If you really want to work for peace, it's almost like a generational project because journalists, teachers, everybody in society somehow must be involved with other tools. <clears throat> but we have now written the new curriculum for first grade, second grade, and third grade. We co uh, cooperate with the Ministry of Education, and we hope to finish up to ninth grade. And when the Turks learn in school what the Armenian thinks, when the Armenians learn in school what the Turks thinks, it's not that risky to enter that dialogue. But uh, we have to accept, currently, it is uh, risky. And I'm stressing that, because some people think that dialogue is cozy. You know, you come together and you have fun. But when you come together and you talk about the real issues, it's a tough, it's a tough challenge. Yeah. Yes. So now we um, are Welcome to questions from the audience. And um, just, um, just to mention, please keep your questions uh, brief and um, so everyone can have a chance to ask the questions and we can have a better discussion. I already see a hand there. Hi, um, my name is Angel. I'm from Israel. I don't know if you noticed that um, like two weeks ago, we had rocket alarm like a lot of times, and uh, both Gaza and Israel shooting like over 500 rockets. So I just want to be direct. Don't you think what we are doing right now is like kind of like bullshit because we are just telling people, oh, we have to have dialogue, but actually, those people who having who has po uh, who have power, they are just using their way to communicate. So, yeah, don't you think, what should we do if it's going to be like that always? <clears throat> well, let, let me twist it around, because if not dialogue, what's the alternative? Because some people say it's the strong, dominant people that benefit from dialogue, because it doesn't really threaten their um, position. So in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, a lot of people say Palestinians don't get anywhere with dialogue because Israel is too powerful. And uh, back, you know, 30, 40 years ago, people would start to actually uh, kidnap airplanes or, you know, bombs would explode in buses and, and cafes because they were so desperate and they wanted to be seen, they wanted to be heard. But like the case with the uh, Armenians uh, blowing up the embassy in, in, in Portugal and these kind of things, 
it doesn't promote their cause. And again, my answer is very boring. When Israelis don't learn about Nakba in schools, because it's actually not allowed to teach about Nakba in, in the schools, which is the kind of exodus of Palestinians in 1948. And Palestinians don't know that much about Holocaust. Uh, so there are within Israel, and I'm working together with a group coming out of Giva Taviva, which is uh, an educational community, developing a concept called shared society. How can we actually share a society when we don't want to live together? And because dialogue is just the communication part. After dialogue, then what? How do you actually do it in terms of curriculum, in terms of public administration, in terms of the use of visual signs in, uh, in the environment? And uh, this group, Giva Taviva, is very uh, exciting, and you can Google them. Uh, we cooperate now with Germany, so there is a group in Germany worried about what is happening in Germany. Germany is becoming divided again. There is a group from Kosovo and there is a group from Northern Ireland together in this uh, shared society thing. But I've been thinking and thinking and thinking. I cannot come up with an other alternative to dialogue. Thank you. I am Rina. I come from Kosovo. And I can see that you are very well informed about uh, the dialogue and the situation in Kosovo. But uh, for my personal opinion, uh, I think that uh, the dialogue should be pushed down into the ground. Because we see our prime ministers first had the dialogue, now it's the presidents, and it's basically the same people just change their positions. Uh, so, do you think that, do you agree with what I am saying, that the people should be talking, not yes. the presidents? I was, I was worried when you said, push down in the ground, I thought you would bury the dialogue, you know. <laughs> but I 100% I agree with you when it comes to, uh, let's say, grassroots and community-based peace building. And, and you're right, I, I've spent, the international community does not believe in dialogue between Serbs and Albanians. And uh, it's very difficult at the moment because Serbs living in Kosovo are even ordered from their own authorities to don't interact with the uh, Albanians. Uh, I'm currently involved with some schools on this intercultural model, but don't tell anybody. I hope you're not streaming this because <laughs> then the Serb authorities will go and get them. Uh, so it's under the radar, but people appreciate the quality of getting together. And to be very blunt, it is the coming generation, that's our hope. And in Kosovo, you have that problem, maybe even more so, but you have it in Israel and Palestine too. You know, the parents teach their children to carry on the conflict. So if you go to a Serbian school and you have Serbian parents, you learn how to not respect Albanians and vice versa. So, of course, we have to go to the grassroots. And the most important group, the most important group is parents. Because everybody has a parent, and parents are police, bartenders, uh, politicians. And, uh, but I've written a few articles that I can make available to you about this work, and I'm still involved. I go to Kosovo two, three times uh, you know, every semester, and I cooperate well with the head of the OSCE. And we will have a shared society gathering in Kosovo in the fall with Israel and with the Northern Ireland and with the Germany. Uh, thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. I've had a lot of stuff to take home. Uh, my question is brief. My name is Sheon from Nigeria. Uh, from the the things I actually really do not understand, I would like if you can expand, shit, expound, and explain them to me. Uh, if we are expected to respect differences and accept diversity and our integration, uh, when we also know that the truth is relative, uh, how can we coexist if we actually live in different realities, realities that are shaped? 
by both our conscious and unconscious bias? That's just my question. So, so I, I said at the beginning, how can we people live together in the best possible way? That's the question we have been raising for thousands of years. We haven't found the answer yet. And I haven't found the answer either. But I've found, I think, a step further. So when we don't recognize that other people have a different moral code, we judge them. We judge them fast and we judge them according to our own standards. And that destroys the trust, the ability to cooperate. Uh, like in Kosovo now, there is no cooperation between North Kosovo and the rest of Kosovo, and it makes the society a dysfunctional society. For a functional society to work, you saw my model, there must be some kind of a loyalty to the minimum. And I don't have an answer to your question, because there are people that honestly believe, you know, I am right and you are wrong. But if we build trust, we can start to communicate about it in a better way. So, so my message, in a way, to you is just that when you go into your groups, if you have trust, respect, you might at least understand each other better, and there might be some of these conflicts that can be solved based on that. But there might also be other conflicts that cannot be solved, and we have to live with them. But uh, I think that you are addressing uh, one of the most important difficulties in how to live together. When some people honestly believe they are right, my challenge to them is, have they sat down? Have they listened to those people they believe are wrong? Have they interacted with them? Have they learned to see the world how they see the world? And no, very often the answer is no. So by promoting a dialogue culture, we are pointing toward the future. Because dialogue is not something that we tried and failed. It has not been tried. I asked my colleague, he's from India, how many books have been written about dialogue in India? I can ask every one of you, how many books about dialogue have been, have been written in your home country? I'm not talking about books about war and peace and, and conflict management or mediation or, or negotiation or rhetoric. I'm talking books about the art of dialogue. The art of dialogue as a way of communicating. In Norwegian, you cannot find 10. In American, you cannot find 10. In Russian, you cannot find 10. And I don't think you can find 10 in India. I don't know about Nigeria. I don't think you can find 10 either. So dialogue, that's the good news. It hasn't failed. It's just never been tried. And a lot of people say, well, uh, to the woman from Israel, I uh, invited uh, Palestinian women filmmakers to come to Lillehammer together with Israeli filmmakers. And uh, the Palestinian women said, no, no, we don't want to do that. We don't want to recognize them by sitting and talking to them. And, and I said, well, I went down to Bethlehem. I sat with them for a day. Do you think Israelis know how you live? No, that's part of the problem. Do you think Israeli journalists, politicians, teachers tell the truth? No, that's part of the problem. But then don't you want to show them the movies you made, which are documentaries about your life? Well, of course we want to show them the movies, but is that dialogue? And then I said, yes, dialogue is to make yourself visible and allowing others to become visible to you. And then they said, wow, we thought dialogue is what's going on at Camp David. I said, wow, Camp David, that's political communication. That's the opposite of dialogue. And they said, okay, okay, well, come. But can you promise us one thing? Don't call it dialogue. <laughs> because dialogue is a little bit destroyed in our country. It, it, it has um, lost its value. So we call the project Other Voices to listen to other voices.
Hello, uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, thank you uh, for the wonderful lecture. Uh, I'm Glide from Philippines. And I have a question because um, three to four years ago, we had, um, uh, we had a war against extremists because ISIS aligned groups um, waged war in Marawi. And then um, our president tried to bargain with them or actually create a dialogue to, um, to understand why they were aligning with ISIS or something like that. But in the end, they actually just uh, used that uh, use that opportunity to actually uh, use the bargaining chip. The, because we had some of the foreigners there that were kidnapped. Uh, one of them was a Norwegian citizen, actually, mm -hmm. to get more ransom. So my question is, um, how do we do dialogue to extremists when they don't want to listen and will use violence to justify their perspective? Mm -hmm. <coughs> well, I got. I got that answer, that question, a lot of times. And uh, on the 22nd of July in 2011, we had a very brutal massacre on an island in Norway. Uh, it was one man, he killed 69 young people. Uh, they were all members of the Labour Party. And the Labour Party represented uh, a threat to Norwegian stability and continuity, Norwegian tradition because the Labour Party were more open to a new multicultural reality in, in Norway. So in his war against uh, transition in Norway, he attacks the future leaders of that political party he believe will have the power. So in his mind, and there are movies now made about this attack, he did the right thing. He fought for what he believed in, and with such a uh, plan that he probably took out 20, 30 potential leaders uh, in the future. He also blew up the government building, but that was not as successful. Um, people have asked me, what would I have done if I was there on the island? I probably could have done nothing. People have asked me uh, if I had been a passenger when these uh, planes flew into the Twin Towers in New York City, what would I have done? I probably could have done nothing. But if I'd been in the neighborhood, I would have tried to include these people 10 years earlier. That's when you can make a difference. And these extreme cases are probably cases where dialogue doesn't work. But that's not an argument against trying to build a dialogue culture in our primary schools, in our high schools, in our neighborhoods, in our communities, because the more we succeed in building a dialogue culture today, the fewer of those kind of incidents we might have in the future. That's my uh, hope. But we think dialogue is appreciated. We think the world leaders you know, cherish dialogue, but they don't. In Norway, one diplomat said, Steiner, you must realize, dialogue is too womanish. It's what women do. If we want to solve conflicts, we've got to use the macho language. And even Norway, that's perceived as a peace nation. We are very warlike in Libya, in Afghanistan, in, uh, in Syria, those places we have uh, soldiers on the ground. Thank you. Um, my name is Musa, and I'm from the Gambia. Um, I actually love your presentation, sir, and uh, uh, for me, I think everything has to do with pride. Um, I think um, everybody's trying to see that we are, we are the people, I mean, we are the, it's our country and everybody's trying to defend his or our country. So, um, sir, there, there can be dialogue, but you go into dialogue with an open mind. That could solve the uh, the that could solve the problem. But if you go to a dialogue with um, this mind of um, we are or it's us, then the dialogue is just a ceremonial dialogue. That's what I believe in. But 
away from that, sir, I just want to know your opinion as an African. I want to know your opinion when it comes to Africa. What do you think about Africa, um, especially the problems in Africa? I think uh, <laughs> I just want to know your opinion, sir. Thank you. Do I have a half an hour? <laughs> <laughs> It's impossible, you know, to, 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 to answer, but in my perception, we are becoming a global world. And in my perception, to move forward, we must organize meeting points where people can meet, not only on Facebook, but also face to face. And whether it's theater, sports, uh, art, politics, academics, uh, just much, much, much more of it. Because we do influence each other. And the countries in Africa have very different uh, problems and challenges. I've been working uh, a lot with the Somalians in Norway and discovered, I didn't even know, you know, Somalians doesn't exist. It's subclans. And there are subclans with Somalians in Norway that have never communicated with each other. They're worse than Serbs and Albanians. <laughs> and uh, in this process of promoting a dialogue culture, you know, United Nations is a very important ally. And uh, we just need to use every opportunity we have to promote uh, a dialogue culture and remind people that it didn't fail, it hasn't properly been uh, tried. But uh, right now, we're all in a way in trouble. And uh, there is not that much dialogue going around. So uh, I'm not sure about Gambia, and I cannot say that. But when I talk to, let's say, people in Kosovo or Macedonia or in the rest of Europe, I say that many of our problems are more similar today than they used to be 20 years ago. Because we all have the ethnic tension. And the ethnic tension seems to be very dominant in a lot of African countries. And ethnic tension is becoming more dominant in uh, European countries. So you can say, we now have more to talk about. We have more experiences to share. And that might be hopeful that we can benefit from that. So we take a question here. Lucas? We take a question here first. Uh, hi, I'm Maria Duarte, I'm from Brazil, and the new president would like to a uh, military authorized government. So how to deal with the return of a conservative in your traditions? Uh, one more time. Okay, sorry. <laughs> the new president uh, would like a military and the uh, authorized government. So how to deal with the return of a conservative in your traditions? Again, it, it's the stress of, the, let's say, the grassroots work. That somehow, uh, how to mobilize, how to mobilize people, how to mobilize communities, how to mo mobilize resistance. And uh, that, is, that is difficult. I mean, in, uh, if you go back to Kosovo, we have a support group in, in northern Kosovo. But sometimes people, when they are traitors, they are threatened. And you know, we're not threatening to beat you up. We're gonna beat up your mother. And what do you do? You know, you're loyal to your mother. And, uh, but again, civil rights in the United States, uh, Martin Luther King knew that he could, was risking his life every day. So to fight against the government, to fight against oppression is risky. It's risk-taking business. And uh, I, heard, I heard Amos Uz, he's an Israeli author, and uh, he just said that, you know, when we see a fire, maybe we don't have a fire truck. Maybe we don't even have a fire hose, but everybody has a teaspoon. And if enough people use their teaspoons, we could see changes in the world. If enough people use their teaspoons, it would have the strength of a fire truck. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, 
My name is uh, Buthaina. I'm from Algeria. Well, my question is that we all are searching to um, to make dialogues to understand each other. At least here in Iswi, everybody is like uh, understanding and try to understand. They're open-minded to things, but back in my country, uh, at least. Um, not everybody is like trying to understand each other. Not everybody is open. And I would really like to uh, know how to make them open to, to each other and to at least listen. Yeah, that, yeah. that would be my question. Uh, yeah, I would give the example that Algeria nowadays is like uh, having a revolution, a peaceful revolution against the, the corrupted system. And it end up, we end up not understanding that we are uh, different and everybody having like different uh, opinion about how the country should be. But when you try to talk to them, everybody uh, does not listen. Everybody thinks that what they have in mind is the right thing to do. Yes. So how to uh, avoid the conflict, how to let them understand or, because I tried and I end up uh, thinking that I should just uh, keep my opinions to myself because they are not listening. Yeah, that would be my question. Thank you. <coughs> the problem sometimes is that we want to change it all. We want to have the perfect plan. We want to somehow know that what we do will make a difference. We cannot know that. And it's impossible for at least, I think, everybody here in this room to change it all. But that's back to the teaspoon. If you use the impossibility of the situation to not use your teaspoon, where you can use your teaspoon, you make a big mistake. Because a lot of people probably think like you, but choose to not do anything. And you are here. You are here. So obviously, what you can do is to go home and say, wow, ISVI was, was uh, amazing. Recruit <coughs> 10 students for next year. Maybe in the group work here, one can spend more time. Maybe the topic in two years can be dialogue. And the group work can be, are there certain tools? Are there certain crutches that can help us in dialogue work back home? How to overcome, how to reach out to those people who don't want to, to dialogue. And in my case, I've dealt with a lot of people that never wanted dialogue. And I've been waiting maybe four, five, six years for them to say, okay. And what I did those four or five years was to drink a lot of coffee with them without uh, begging or, or, you know, nagging them, but showing that I care and I want to not give up. I want to somehow have an open door and Actually, it works. After five years, some people said, uh, radical Serbs in Bjarnovac, Prešovo, okay, okay, we'll come. Since you didn't give up, we'll honor that. <laughs> well, I think that change uh, doesn't happen in a, a short period of time. No. There needs to be patience. Yes. Dialogue is, uh, dialogue is not a magic fix. Dialogue is not a magic fix, and social transition is generational. We see too often when change happens too fast, there is a backlash because the change wasn't really rooted in the ground. So given the interest of time, we will take two questions together. Uh, Lucas, would you? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for your presentation on dialoguing. I'm Alvin Tepotoba, a Liberian from the Pan-African University. Uh, I want to ask you regarding dialogue. You know, many times people enter dialogue without, uh, without uh, an open mind and without honesty, because most dialogue tend to fail after a few couple of years. You know, people go to dialogue, they settle an issue, but after just a short while, what was presumably settled, it pops up again. So what do you think is the role of having a honest conversation in dialoguing? 
in my in my work, I have always said that dialogue is just the start. So after the dialogue, what's the follow up? And if I say that a dialogue seminar is five percent, and the follow up is ninety five percent, by follow up I mean the people that have been together in a dialogue. It can be teachers in a school. In uh, Bjanovac, one community in South Serbia, I invited the whole municipal assembly because they were always fighting. So the whole municipal assembly, 47 people, came to Norway. When they came to Norway, they saw something different. It's like you're in a swimming pool, and if you swim in the same swimming pool your whole life, you think this is how swimming pools are. This is how hot they are, this is how dirty they are, this is how big they are. The moment you see another swimming pool, it doesn't mean that that is better, but it's different. And you start to understand, hey, wait a minute, there are different swimming pools around. Uh, where do I want to, where do I want to swim? The follow-up work is keeping this group together because the group doesn't stay together by themselves. So you might even say that in my work, I have wanted to be a bridge builder to build bridges between people, but in many cases, I had to be the bridge myself. So when I came the next time and invited everybody to dinner, they said, actually, we haven't met since last time we had a dialogue. And then we might organize a new dialogue seminar. We have to continue, follow up, follow up, follow up. Yeah, thank you very much. My name is Ibaima, uh from the West Africa, uh, Gambia. I think uh, I have a lot of stuff to take home. Uh, your presentation in terms of dialogue uh, uh, for the relations of relationship between parents and children reminds me of the quote that uh, education uh, commences at parents' knee is an every word that is spoken within the hearing of little children tends towards the formation of their character, attitude, and behavior. Uh, but I just want to uh, bring my country uh, into perspective here. For example, uh, some time ago, we have a dictator, and then we voted him out. Uh, he accepted. A uh, few days later, he came and rescinded his decision. He said, yes, I accepted the results, but now I did not accept. We will have to go back to the polls. Uh, we did all kinds of dialogue, religious leaders, civil societies, everybody. But it uh, resulted as food right. But later, when you have the econ economic, economic forces, like the outside forces, that threaten to come and fight, and he knows there is no way, uh, he give up and, and, and run away. So I'm trying to uh, ask here if there is any way that we can have a hard dialogue, kind of. And for example, in my school also, like in my university, we will have like to get a bus, like bus transportation from for the students. Like the university management will waste time. They will say no. Uh, we will dialogue. They will say no. But like when we say we will come out, now they will give us a bus. Now I'm trying to say now is there is any way that we can have a, a hard dialogue kind of because soft dialogue don't seem to work in Africa. That's my question. Thank you. I. I would say that most of the dialogues I have participated in has been very hard in terms of very strong accusations. Why did you burn down my house? Why did you do this? Why did you do that? And <clears throat> I don't have any communication rules. I don't have any, let's say, techniques, except questions and answers. And in the beginning of a dialogue, there is not much dialogue. There is only debate. People are fighting verbally. And uh, if you have ice in the stomach and you can stay on a few days, they will ease into more silent water. So at least you know, they stop the accusations and start to be willing to listen. No, I didn't burn down your house. I saw what happened. Do you want to hear what I saw? And um, so this is some kind of a, a myth that dialogue is uh, soft. Uh, then it's more like a human conversation, you know? Then it's more like a, a nice talk. Then it's more like being together and, and uh, you know. Uh, dialogue, the way I define it, is 
inviting people in direct conflict to talk about the conflict itself and the causes and the consequences of that conflict. And that's brutal. In Bosnia and Herzegovina, 100,000 people were killed in the war recently. So almost everybody have lost somebody in, in the war. And it's painful. But not everybody, but 90%. I said, I've been personally in Lillehammer observing 3,000 people. Probably in shorter seminars around the world, I've been observing almost 10 times as much. And I would say that in 90% of the cases, dialogue moves things forward. But not always. I've had people get up and leave. I've had uh, people storm out, but I've never had people start physical fights in front of me. I once had another facilitator helping me, and he started to fight. But that was another problem. <laughs> So, we could go on, and Steiner always has beautiful explanations. Uh, however, uh, he has a train to catch very soon, and um, unfortunately, we must end here. So, again, thank you, Dr. Bryn, uh, for this enlightening talk. Um, You've truly set the tone for the conference, and I'm sure we will use the inspiration and the ideas that you have provided us here throughout the conference. And yeah, to conclude, we would present to you a small token of our appreciation. <laughs>